Hey folks, welcome, welcome. Going to go ahead and close that out. How's everybody doing today? Um, as per usual, I'd like to make sure that you can see and hear me okay. Uh, there might be a little bit of stack it, stack, static in the microphone. I noticed that whenever it starts for the first five seconds or so, there's some static, maybe 10 seconds, but then it, it seems to chill out. So let's make sure you can see and hear me. You see and hear me. Hope you had a great weekend and that everything went fine. Um, maybe got to do a little R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. My guess is you probably did a boatload of, uh, of, of homework. Um, Ellie, Elias, Elia, sounds like you can see and hear me. Fantastic. That's great. Um, yeah, I always feel like I look forward to the weekends, obviously. Um, but I just, I, I end up working all through it, right? Which is fine because then you can start Monday feeling like you're kind of on top of things. And that's kind of nice. I like that. Uh, on the other hand, you wake up Monday morning and go, oh my gosh, do we need to do it all over again? Yes. Yes, we do. We need to do it all over again. All right. Well, hey, let's go ahead and get started. What are we talking about today? We're talking about business speak. Okay, now we'll define what that is, but let's go ahead and uh, play with an idea here. And I'm going to get myself a little highlighter, a uh, lack of my highlighters. Let's go ahead and uh, play with an idea here for a moment. I don't know if anybody here speaks Dutch. I don't speak Dutch, but let's see if we can figure out what this means. And feel free to kind of put in the comments what you think this means. Um, you'd be surprised. All right. So, mijn naam is Lon Schiffbauer. Okay. What do you think that means? Any guesses? Let's keep going on. Mijn huis is in Sandy, Utah. By the way, I'm totally butching, butchering the pronunciation. I know. I know I'm butchering the pronunciation. Pronunciation. I can't even pronounce pronounce. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. So, my name is Lon Schiffbauer. My house is in L Sandy, Utah. Ich habe eine Frau at Fief. Kinderen. What do you think that means? Let's go ahead and uh, go over to, I'm going to leave this up, but I'm going to disappear for a moment. You tell me what you think this means. Okay. So give that some thought. Now, normally, because I'm going to disappear to kind of say, hey, I want you to focus on that. Now, normally when I do my, uh, you know, what does this mean? I like have music going and so forth, but I don't want to take that off of the screen. So uh, let's see. Um, I guess I need to supply the music for you. So while you're writing that in, I'm going to sing a song for you. Okay. Fish heads, fish heads, roly poly, fish heads, fish heads, fish heads, eat them up, yum. I took a fish head out to see a movie, didn't have to pay to get it in. That's a nice little ditty for you. Hopefully you've got some things, you're writing some things in. I can't see the screen, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll sing another little, little song. Let's see. My puppy died late last fall. He's still rotting in the hall. Dead puppies aren't much fun. No, no, no. Okay, so let's see if you got some stuff in there. All right, we do. My name is Lon Schiffbauer. Yes, you are correct. This right here, my name is Lon Schiffbauer. I live in Sandy, absolutely. 
you guys are getting, and hey, you know what this means, by the way, that means we're getting uh, some awesome comments because you're getting there. And we've also got two contributors starting. Good. All right. So my name is Lon Schiffbauer. My house is in Sandy, Utah. Now, Frau, what do you think a Frau is? And what do you think Kinderen are? Frau, maybe think German. Kinderen, think kindergarten. Kindergarten, Kinderen. Thief, that looks like something. Well, I'll tell you what this means. My name is Lon Schiffbauer. My house is in Sandy, Utah. I have a wife and five children. Now, really, trust me, ah, four children. Four, yeah, I could see that being four. It's actually five, but yeah, I would, I would see that, right, Lawrence? Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and get Lawrence in there. All right. Um, now, trust me, and you got it. All right. Now, yeah, okay, granted, it's, it's pretty basic and so forth, but I want you to pause, pause for just a moment and embrace the fact that you just read Dutch. You don't speak Dutch, but you just read Dutch. All right. So then let's do something easy. We all speak English to some degree or another. So let's look at something in English. This is from a business proposal. I'll tell you more about it in a moment. It was for a website redesign project. They were redesigning a website. This company wanted to redesign a website. So here's what they have. Use a constituent-centric design approach with early input from business cons consumers using design thinking best practices to help inform user need and expectations. You know what? I'm not even going to sing fish heads for this one. I'm not going to pause and say, what do you think this means? Because as close as, close as I can figure out, what this means is ask users what they need, then design a great website around those needs. That's it. Use a constituent-centric design approach meaning you're going to focus on what the user needs with early input from business consumers. All right. Meaning you're going to ask them using design thinking best practices, meaning you're going to design a good site to help inform user needs and expectations. Okay. So if that means this, why didn't they just say that? Okay. Now, I'm not making this up. Imagine single space, 20 pages of this nonsense. That's what this business proposal was. This was a business proposal given uh, to a local, well, not local, but a, a, they have a local site tech company to redesign their intranet. That's their employee internet. And it ha it's all full of this language, all of it, all of it. Okay. So, um, this is really common, super, super common. All right. There's a couple of good books out there. One, here's a, there's a book called, uh, um, yeah, on bullshit. Don't turn me into the thought police because that's the actual name of the book. And then here's a study that was done on the rep, um, reception and detection of pseudo profound bullshit. Oh, I love that title. Here's what they said. Here's the definition. Something that isn't so much false as it is phony. Something that is designed to impress, but that was constructed absent direct concern for the truth. Okay. So if we went back and looked at the constituent centric best practices, design approach, and so on and so forth. There's nothing false in there. All right. It's, it's, it's not a lie, but 
it's just really designed to impress and it's not really focusing on what they want you to focus on. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. The first thing I wanna do though is, um, well, heck, let's read this one. This one comes from uh, um, a book called Why Business People Speak Like Idiots. Real book, good book. Bull speak is the language of business, otherwise known as corporate doublespeak, buzzword spin, or just plain old BS. This style of speaking seems to be encouraged in most large organizations. Not seems to be encouraged, my friends. It is absolutely 100% not only encouraged, but pretty much required. Okay, we're going to come back to that. So, yes, business people are enamored with big words, acronyms, and phrases with multiple interpretations. Okay, this is just the facts. So, this is what I want to do. And this one we will go over to a question thing. I want you to and just blurt out all kinds of stuff, right? Um, you know, don't overthink this. Trust me, don't overthink this. Just come up with any ideas that come to mind on why do you think people speak like this in business, okay? Good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. Why do you think people speak like this in business? Let's go ahead and um, mull that over for a couple of minutes. I'm looking for my button. Okay, very good, very good. Let's, uh, so first of all, I'm gonna go ahead and reduce myself there so that we can get some. Um, so first of all, we have now got, let's see, um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know what? Boom, so one, oh, did the wrong number. So we're taking this up to 10, right? Which means, Time to send, just write down real quick the timestamp. Let's see, it's 8.43. So as I say there, you want to send me an email with the timestamp so that uh, we can put a little something extra in your coffers, okay? Um, and then when it comes to contributors, we got at least three new contributors. So I'm going to bang it up there. Okay, now let's look at these. So you guys are bang on, right? We want to sound smart and trustworthy. We absolutely do. And we're going to talk about that. So, um, Braden, you're, you're, you're bang on right there, right? So is Elias. We want to sound more exciting than we are. Okay, you're talking about me. All right, I'm taking points away from you. All right, you're talking about me. I know I sell this hard. I sell this stuff hard. But actually, I am pretty excited. I love this stuff. I'm just giving you a hard time. You're right. 
um, we want to look smart, says Sadie, and um, have a perfect vocabulary so it sounds better. Yeah, very much. Sound professional, Nicole says. Sadie, we want to overdo it. Yeah, okay. You guys are right, all right? And it's that and much more. So let's play with these ideas. Um, I really like this quote. I'm going to throw this quote at you because it kind of eludes at some of the reasons. Elaborate ritual and language designed to bamboozle and mystify and intimidate. Okay, let's break this down. Now, by the way, as I go through and say all this, I need to, um, I need to confess something. I am absolutely and totally fluent in business speak. I spent a decade at Intel. I spent a couple of years over at eBay. I've worked for a variety of tech companies and large companies, and business speak is the norm. And I spent easily 10 years writing in and teaching people how to speak in business speak. And I live with that guilt every day. So I kind of know what I'm talking about here because everything I'm about to show you, I am guilty of. Everything I'm about to show you, I am guilty of. Okay, so <laughs> let's get to the nasty stuff. All right, first of all, there are some actual good reasons why we use business speak. And some of you, pointed out some, some valid reasons, right? Let's look at some of them. You want to be taken seriously. You just do, right? Um, gosh, perception is everything, people. Perception is reality. And you want to be perceived as someone who is intelligent, informed, and therefore credible and trustworthy. This is really important in business. I can't overstress this. It is very important that in the workplace, you are perceived as intelligent, informed, credible, and trustworthy. And yes, to a certain degree, business speak helps us. Here's the problem. Don't worry, I'm gonna get to the nasty. I need to stay in the positive. Stay in the positive, Lon. But I do want to point something out. Check out this word, perceived. Perceived doesn't necessarily mean it's true. We'll come back to that. Okay, let's keep going. To practice economy of language, this is kind of the purpose of jargon, all right? So let me give you an example. Um, I'll give, let's do this one. I have a hard stop at 2 p.m., all right? So let's talk about this one for a moment. The phrase is, and this is an Intel phrase, I used it for 10 years, I have a hard stop. I have a hard stop. That's it. Well, what does a hard stop mean? Well, I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that at two o'clock, in this case, I say I have a hard stop at 2 p.m., it means at two o'clock, I have something else I have to attend to. Maybe it's another meeting. Maybe it's an errand I need to run. Maybe it's some work I need to get done. It doesn't matter, but it is a priority. And so at 2 p.m., I have something else to attend to. So if we're on the phone in a phone meeting, which you do a ton of in the corporate world, phone meetings, then at two o'clock, I am going to hang up. I am not going to ask permission. I am not going to excuse myself. I am not going to apologize. I am simply at 2 p.m. going to hang up the phone. If come close to 2 p.m., you realize that we're running short on time, but you need another 10 minutes and you ask, can I have an extra 10 minutes? I am going to say no. All of that is a hard stop. Well, now, which would you rather do? Go through that entire spiel at the beginning of a conference call or just say, hey, by the way, heads up, I have a hard stop at 2 p.m. 
So that's economy of words, economy of language, um, an economy of language that has a lot of meaning, okay? And so you can convey a lot. Uh, another one that um, in Intel, I'll take that action item or an AR, I'll take that AR. That means I will be held responsible for that particular task. I agree to take it on. I will complete it as outlined. I will report out to the right people and I will, you know, take ownership and responsibility for it. That's what it means if that's my AR. I'll take that AR. Okay? That's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. All right. Establish in groups. Now, here's, let me explain. Remember, I, I said earlier that uh, to a psychologist, uh, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, I'm a psychologist, and so everything looks like um, a psychological mechanism. And when it comes to communication, it is. So what's an in-group? An in-group is a tribe, a cadre, you know, your peeps, right? And we establish bonds of, of trust and reliance on one another. And language is a fantastic way of kind of you kind of touching these cultural touchstones, if you will. So, for example, if um, you guys with your friends, let's just say your friends, you have all kinds of buzzwords and jargon and so forth that you use that just kind of remind one another that you're on the inside of my circle, right? Whereas if somebody else who's on the outside tries to use those same words, First of all, they're not going to use them correctly. It's going to be disingenuous, and it's going to be a red flag that this person does not know what they're talking about, and they're not on the inside. Now, when it comes to the workplace, it's actually really important that you have a close collaborative relationship with your coworkers. When it comes to waking hours, hours in which you are awake, you spend more time with your coworkers than you will with your spouses or friends or partners, okay? If you're awake 16 hours out of the day and you're spending 10 hours at work, boom, <laughs> that's 10 hours, right? 10 out of 16. And so it's important that we have those relationships. And language is a great way to establish cultural touchstones that allow us to kind of communicate to one another that you're on the inside. You're one of ours. You're one of the good ones. Okay. So those are the, what I believe are some positives, but trust me, there are devils out there. And there are some really, to me, distressing reasons why we engage in this sort of business speak, all right? Well, one of the, I say here why the, per, the answer is in the purpose. Now, I want to pause just on that for a moment. The answer is in the purpose. Remember, I said in previous lectures and in previous videos, it all starts with the purpose. It all starts with the purpose. What is the purpose in trying to commun in, in communicating? Now, in business, it's awfully easy to say, well, it's to convey information, to relay information, to give information, to relay, convey information, data, ideas, things like that. <clears throat> well, yeah, sometimes it is. Hopefully, often it is. But that is not always the purpose in communicating. Let's look at some other purposes that people may have in communicating and why they therefore would employ business speak. Obfuscate. I use that word on purpose because it's a word that obfuscates what it is. Learn that word, it's a fun word. It means to render obscure, unclear, or unintelligible. 
In other words, we want to hide bad information in plain sight. Business speak allows us to hide all kinds of things in, in plain sight. And this is highly distressing to me and something I want to teach you to recognize when it happens. So, what would we want to hide in plain sight? Well, let's take a look at some things. First of all, how do we hide in plain sight? Well, one thing we can do to hide in plain sight, to hide things, is to weaponize boredom. So let's say for a moment that I'm giving a presentation and I don't know what I'm talking about. Now, you know that feeling, guys. You've written papers where you felt like, I don't really know what I'm talking about here. I'm not confident. And, or you've done presentations and you're not uber confident in what you're talking about. And so you want to kind of hide your ignorance, hide the fact that you're not well prepared, hide the fact that you did not research the material, hide the fact that your findings are weak at best. You want to hide these things. You've done it. I've done it. Let me remind you, I am guilty of all of these. Okay? So, maybe I'm not well prepared. Maybe I did not research things properly. Maybe the project is going south. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Who knows? So, what can I do? Well, I can weaponize boredom. What's weaponizing boredom? Oh, I should have had another thing here, another scene prepared so I could show you weaponizing boredom. Weaponizing boredom is exactly opposite of what I'm trying to do here. It's, okay, so today we're going to talk about business communication and how we use it sometimes for purposes that are not necessarily about conveying information. Sometimes we want to hide the fact that maybe we haven't done the research properly. Oh my gosh, you are already zoning out. And yet that even had some animations around and some cool lighting and so on and so forth. And so think about for a moment when you are on a Zoom meeting and you're just like, oh, there is no God. I am so bored. All right, I am so bored. And so you have, you have more than one monitor. I know you have more than one monitor. You've got all kinds of stuff going on on the other monitor. Well, the more boring something is, the more attention you're going to pay to the other monitor. Well, you know what? If I haven't done my research, and if I don't know what I'm talking about, and if I'm ill-prepared, I don't want you to pay attention to me. I am going to deliberately make you bored. So that at the end of my presentation, when I say, hey, do you have any questions? Any questions at all? You're all going to go, huh? What? Oh, uh, no. No questions. Yeah, you don't have any questions because you didn't listen to a single word I said, and that was by design. That is weaponizing boredom. Now, another reason we speak like this is to intimidate. All right. This is big. This is big in the business world. One of the guys, here's, here's, here's an unfortunate truth I would like to share with you. A lot of you are in school. I think a lot of you are in school for this reason. I was. I was in school thinking, you know what? I want to work at a higher level in a more professional environment. I want to work with a higher caliber of per people because here at the hourly wage when I'm working, I was working all kinds of hourly jobs just like you guys have done. I was working all kinds and the people I was working with, oh my gosh, there was intimidation, there was backbiting, there was throwing under the bus, there was all kinds of gossip and rumors, and you, you name it. And I was like, man, I am so done with this. I want to work with a higher caliber of person. Well, you will. 
you will work with a higher caliber of person. I'm fidgeting. But I got news for you. The backbiting, the throwing under the bus, the sort of bullying, that doesn't go away. It merely becomes more sophisticated. And you need to prepare yourself for this. And if you want to talk more about that later on, we can. But here's what I'm coming down to. Intimidation. Now, there's a lot of ways to intimidate in the overt high school bullying world. Intimidation was done by getting up in your face, you know, and all that sort of stuff, bumping and, you know, all the gorilla stuff, right? Corporate world doesn't do the gorilla stuff. Intimidation is done through language. And it is meant to make you feel small, inadequate, and uneducated. If I use all kinds of terms and language and vocabulary and jargon and refer to projects and company histories and so on and so forth, and you don't understand anything I say, you're going to just sit there and be quiet. You are going to back off. You are going to be submissive because I am trying to convey to you, uh, this is my world. This is my house. And you are not worthy to be here. This is language is a way that we bump out our chests and so forth. All right. I'm telling you, I've been guilty of all of this. Last one. Speak as though the content itself is self-evidently and incontrovertibly true. Here's the idea. And this happens with all of these. I don't want you to challenge me. I don't want you to challenge me. Remember, I'm ill prepared. I have not done the research. My findings are lackluster at best and things are not going well. And I don't know what I'm talking about. So I don't want you to ask any questions. I don't want you to ask a thing. I don't want you to challenge me. I don't want you to force me to have to support something. And so I am going to speak as though any moron can see that this is true. And if you don't see that it's true, you're the dummy in the room. So when I'm intimidating, when I'm intimidating you and speaking as though everybody in the room knows that this is obviously true, you're not going to challenge me. Now, think about this. Even when you're in a, in a classroom and you have a question or you don't agree with something that I say, and I'm, I'm talking you and me right now, not hypothetically, proverbially, I'm talking about this. If, if, if you have a question and don't understand something, you are loath, you are hesitant to ask a question because you have this concern in your head that I'm probably the only one who doesn't know the answer to this. And I do not want to expose to the other students that I don't understand this, because then I'm exposing to the other students that I'm slow. That's constantly going through your head. Remember, I'm a student too, I know. Um, well, business speak, wants you to feel that way. Business speak wants you to be quiet, to fall asleep, to feel intimidated, to feel like you would be a fool for asking questions and you're the only one who doesn't get it. And the last thing you want is for all your peers and bosses to see that you're asking questions that you should already know the answer to. Okay. Do you get the sense that I feel passionately about this? All right. Here's another one. And this one is unfortunately built on a truth. Okay. Create the perception of difficulty versus ease over engineer. All right. What do I mean by this? Well, and this really bothers me. This bothers me a lot. Um, but I haven't been able to figure out the answer. I mean this. 
Okay, this is something, I've been on this earth half a decade. I've been in the business world for 25, 30 years. I have an MBA and a PhD, and I have not been able to figure out the answer to this, and it really bothers me. So I'm really open to thoughts. Um, you know how when somebody makes something look easy, you go, oh my gosh, they make it look so easy. Well, we should make things look easy. We should because we're good at what we do. We're competent. We're well-practiced. We research it and we enjoy it and we get it. We should make our work look easy. The problem is in the business world, when you make your work look easy, you make your contribution look less valuable. You look dispensable. Because how hard can it be after all? Look, all you're doing is this, that, and the other, and, and, and how hard can it be? Because you're making it look easy. Um, and if your work is called into question because it's too easy, then you're seen as dispensable. I have a very close friend who was the director of HR at a company, and he was really good, really good. Um, in fact, he was so good, he made it look easy. And he was laid off. Simply because the company could not really understand, what are you doing, right? On the other hand, if you make something look impossibly complicated, like, oh my gosh, how does she do it? How can he get all that? That's, um, it, this is if you make something look impossibly complicated, then all of a sudden, the value that people attribute to you goes up. Because I can't do it. I don't know anybody who can do it. That looks insane. And so as a result, you have every motivation, and this is what bothers me, you have every motivation in the business world to make your contributions look more complicated than they really are. And you have every motivation to hide the fact that it's really not all that hard. And so we over-engineer. We over-engineer things. Um, it should be exactly opposite. We should reward people who find efficiency and get really, really good at what they do, organizational learning, but we don't. And so business speak does this. Now, remember this whole thing, my whole diatribe here, started with a story of a company that wanted to create the intranet for a tech company. And so they created, they wrote a 20 page single space document of all business speak saying what they were gonna to do to create this website. And it was gonna cost a million dollars. Well, I speak as though they didn't get it. They did get the contract, they did. But my friends, I was there and I was part of the team that helped implement this. It was not that difficult. And it certainly wasn't a million dollar project by no stretch of the imagination. But contractors and consultants, and I've been a contractor and I'm a consultant, it's in our best interest to make something look more difficult, more complex, more complicated than it really is. And business speak is a great way to hide the fact that something's easy. This bugs me, bugs me a lot. Okay, let's keep going. So. I just went about my whole diatribe around some of the virtues of business speak, but a lot of the vices. And I hope, I hope examples have come in your head. And by the way, remember, we don't have, uh, if I come over here, check this out. Remember, if you have some real world examples of where you think business speak has been used in some of the positive or negative ways. Remember, if you pull those bad boys up and we get some more comments, we'll get some extra points, okay? So I just went off and said, hey, this is business speak. 
So how should you speak? What is good business communication? So let's go over that. Good business communication starts with one thing. It absolutely must start with this. By the way, that's an example of making something incontrovertibly true. If I say it absolutely must start with this, I'm conveying passion and I'm using language that says this is not open for debate. Just so you know, I still do this stuff. But let me now make a case. It has to be compelling and grab the audience's attention. Ooh, I wonder why I did that. Huh. Um, has to grab the audience's attention. Here's my, here's my argument for this. If the person, if you don't have the audience's attention, what are the odds that you're going to be able to communicate anything? Zilch, not a, let's say it's an email. Okay, it's an email. Um, and you're going to be doing an email assignment here pretty soon. If I don't have your attention in the email and you don't read it, I have zero capability of communicating to you through that email. Okay, let's take these live streams, for example. If I don't have your attention, if I do not offer something that's compelling, um, I'm not going to have your attention and I cannot properly communicate this information. So it's, it's incumbent upon me to grab your attention. Did it earlier by juggling. Okay, so now when you grab their attention, you really need to make clear what's in it for me, why should I care from their perspective, right? What's in it for me? Why should I care? You're about, you, here's the thing. Let's say it's an email or this live stream. You're giving me your time. You're giving me your attention. These, my friends, are finite resources. You have limited time and limited attention, limited energy, and a lot of responsibilities. So if you're going to give me your time and attention and energy, I better make sure that I convey to you what's in it for you. Why should I care? If I look at an email from my college, or if I look at an email from a client, or if you, well, yeah, I don't know, whatever. If I don't get an immediate sense of why this is important to me, delete, delete. Think of all the emails that you've deleted before you even read more than the first line because they did not communicate to you why this is important to you. And then the other thing you need to do is you need to anticipate their questions within reason. It's not your job to answer every single possible question in an email or something like this. Um, but you want to be able to anticipate their questions to some degree. So for example, in this case, uh, and questions I've anticipated is, you know, is business speak all bad? No, it's not. Um, where do I get my expertise from business speak? I explained, I, I used it a lot of intel. Um, where have I gotten this? A lot of this is research from, from different sources and I've cited the sources. A lot of this is my own anecdotal experience. Um, you know, so I've anticipated these sort of questions and hopefully have answered them as we go. Okay, so looking for the right button. Oh, I can't wait to buy a stream deck. I'm saving my pennies. Okay, so first thing, good business communication is compelling. And I'm trying to do that here. All right, next then, good business communication should be direct, all right? Very early on, I mean, really early on, like in the first paragraph, you should answer who, what, when, where, how, why, okay? So if I were doing something like uh, business communication in, a, in an email, I'd say, um, you know, 
who is to you what I'm going to talk about business communication where at this live stream when at 8 a.m. Why? Because you're going to run into this a ton. How are we going to do it? We're going to do it in a live stream, that sort of thing. You want them to get all the information they need as quickly as possible. Now, to do this, we're going to use the inverted pyramid. Now, what I'd like to do is for the inverted pyramid, I'm going to use the whiteboard. OK, let me show you what I mean by the inverted pyramid. Inverted means upside down, backwards, whatever. So we have our inverted pyramid. Let's say for a moment we're doing an email. Remember, there's all kinds of channels I'm just using as an example. At the very beginning, you put your most important information at the very beginning. OK, and this should be the who, what, when, where, how, why should be at the very beginning. And then as you go along the email, the information becomes progressively less important. OK. Now, you know the reasons. Who reads a whole email? They're probably going to stop reading right about there once they get the gist. And so you want to make sure they have the most important information in there. OK, um, and now if they're really interested in the topic and they want more data and they want more information and they want to know the background and how this decision was made and yada, 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 maybe they'll read on a little bit. But most of the time, no. OK, now, you know this to be true. You know that people don't read the entire material because you quite often have not read the entire assignment or you have not read the done the entire reading. Um, I know for a fact that we don't watch the entire video. So, for example, I did a whole bunch of videos. Um, earlier for you to learn about fundamentals of communication. Each one of these videos is about mm, eight to 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes. The average view time, four minutes. OK, this is not a slam against you. This is not a slam against you. This, I do the same thing. You all do the same thing. Don't let anybody ever guilt you into thinking that you are somehow deficient for not doing all the reading or reading every single word of the assignment or watching the whole video. We all do this because time and energy and attention is finite and we are looking for just what we need for the assignment or the decision or what have you. And so we want to use the inverted pyramid. Because the inverted pyramid recognizes that we only have a little bit of their attention, get the stuff they need first. OK. Avoid industry specific words or acronyms. So I'm not going to use words like pedagogy and matriculate and, you know, learning outcomes and, you know, CCOs. I'm Still not sure what CCO means. Barbie, Barbie's my boss. Barbie, if you're watching this and you just heard me say I don't know what a CCO is, come on. I, I'm sorry. I don't. I should. <laughs> it's actually part of my job. I don't. So don't use industry specific words or acronyms, right? Make sure there's a clear call to action. What are you asking me to do? And oh, by the way, that clear call to action. Yeah, that clear call to action up there, right? Tell me what you want me to do. Just tell me. All right. Don't go up. Oh, my gosh. Think about all the emails you've gotten that go on with all this ponderous sort of Oh, during this time in the season, I like to sit back and meditate upon the things that we learned. And it has struck me that 
you know, in this particular time and space. Just, just, just stop it. Just stop it. What do you want me to do? Just tell me what you want me to do. I've got a life. I want to move on with it. So make sure that you have a good, strong, clear call to action and it's stated early. All right, let's keep going. Simple, clear, concise. Simple, clear, and concise. Hey, you probably remember from high school English, or if English is a second language, you studied this as well, compound complex sentences. Uh, no, no, no compound complex sentences. Simple sentences, a few compound sentences, no compound complex sentences. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's just fine. Just keep it simple, clear, and concise. I like the grandmother test. Now, this is not a slam against grandmothers at all. It's simply this. How would you convey this information to somebody who knows nothing about it? Okay. So, for example, later on today, I'm going to be part of a QM process for a new, a new uh, class that we're offering uh, for a gen ed elective under the GI, IG designation. You understood none of that. QM process, gen ed designation, IG. Well, even if I'd say, well, QM is quality matters. What's quality matters? All right. Well, quality matters is actually a process that we do to design curriculum around um, effective online learning based on learning objectives. What? Okay. This is what we need to do. This is what QM is all about. You know how when you take a class and you're never really sure where the class is going or what you're supposed to learn or how you can use this in the real world? The QM process that I'm doing for this class that's going to be offered next fall, make sure that students know exactly what's going on, what they're supposed to get out of the class, and where they can use it in the real world. That's the grandmother test, okay? Instead of QM process for IG designated gen end course, okay? Bullet points, yes, yes. Exactly, right? And bullet points, and let me come back to uh, this, um, bullet points that, that anybody can understand. Anybody, all right? Uh, you know, many of you guys, you all work in industries that if you were to tell me what you do and use insider speak, I wouldn't understand, right? So in that case, I'm the grandmother. All right. Um, Avoid stuff that's not directly related to the topic. Oh my gosh. So ugh, I hate it when it's like, okay, what do you want me to do? When do you need me to do it? How do I do it? And what's in it for me? Just tell me that. Don't say, you know, uh, you know, research has shown that, you know, on a slightly tangential topic, stay focused, simple, clear, concise. All right. Natural and friendly, okay? Sentences flow in a natural way, right? Talk to your audience. I'll come back to the no spend, not about them. So I hope, I hope that um, the way that I do these live streams comes across in a natural and friendly way. I hope that you feel like I'm being uh, inclusive and friendly, and this is just who I am. I'm not making any, I'm not trying to play a role or anything. Um, and I'm not reading from a script. Oh my gosh, I don't know. I, I had this one professor one time who you could see they were even uh, in this live stream. It wasn't a live stream, it was Zoom. But you could see he was reading a script. And I was like, dude, really? Um, and talk to your audience, not about them. What do I mean by that? Well, you're have, communication is communication. 
even though you're not here right now and I can't see your face or hear your voice, I can read your comments. And I hope that you feel like we're having some sort of conversation together. Sure, I know, in truth, I'm just here in a room by myself, right? But I really, I don't feel that. I feel like I'm with you and I want you to feel like that. Okay. Now, I also said no spin. I don't know if you know what spin means. Let me, let me explain that. Spin means to try to make um, bad news sound not so bad, or maybe even try to make it like something that was done that is not going to be to your benefit was done for your benefit, which is totally baloney. And what the communication is trying to do is fool you. I hate this. The folks, your audience is not as stupid as you think they are. And when you treat them like you can pull the wool over their eyes, they will hold it against you because they can see right through that. Remember a quote I said earlier that I really liked? I said was uh, one of the purposes of, of business speak was to bamboozle. Bamboozle is to fool, right? And try to trick you into thinking this is actually a good thing. No, it's not. And they will see through it. Trust me, they will see through it. So we don't want to spin. We don't want to try to bamboozle. We don't want to try to trick them. Okay. Last one, credible. Now, you guys totally pointed out earlier that business speak does make us sound credible. It does. So we need to use it sparingly in the right ways. We want to be perceived as intelligent, well-informed. All right. But the best way to come across as intelligent and well-informed is to use facts and data, right? Um, so, for example, in this presentation that I've done with you, I've referenced five sources. OK, now I'm not going to go back and say it was here, here, here and here, but I've referenced five sources, right, including books, academic papers, podcasts from learned scholars and so forth. So I have used facts and data to present this. So I hope I'm coming across as credible as well as my own personal stories. Facts and statistics are attributed to a credible source. You notice I put little citations down there at the bottom. So if you wanted to, what, hit pause and try to read that bottom? Not going to happen. Actually, I've thought about, and I really, I'm, I'm going to do this, not just thought about, I'm going to. I'm going to get in the habit of taking all my sources and put them in the description below so that you can pull up those sources and check them out for yourself but they need to be attributed to a credible source. Origin of the message should be clear. Let me come back to that one. And then of course, solid spelling and grammar. That's obvious, but don't underestimate it. Let's talk about origin of the message should be clear. Um, you've probably heard um, this a lot, right in active, voice, not passive voice. This is one of these things that you've probably heard a thousand times in English classes and writing classes, and you're like, huh? Right? You've heard it, but it's hard to understand. Actually, maybe you understand it just fine. I always struggled with it. Active voice basically, at a very basic level, includes who is doing it. Whereas passive voice hides who's doing it. So a stu here's just a very, very simple example. Um, the mail carrier delivered the mail. The mail, the mail was delivered and we know by whom the mail carrier. That's active voice because we know who did it. Versus the mail was delivered. The mail was delivered. Well, who delivered the mail? Now, in this case, in this particular example, it doesn't really matter because we, but we all know 
implicitly who delivered the mail, the mail carrier. But now, what about, it's been decided that we're going to lay off this department. It's been decided that this department will see layoffs. Who, what, who decided there were gonna be layoffs? What data did they look at? How did they make that decision? Who are they? When a communication kind of hides where the decision came from, the origin of the decision, then you're not coming across as credible. It's been decided that this department is overstaffed. It's been decided that we need to cut our budget. Who? Because you're talking about things that directly impact me. And furthermore, you're going to ask me to take action. So if you're going to talk about something that directly impacts me and you're going to ask me to take action, you better be forthcoming with who made these decisions, how were these decisions made, and how is it impacting them? Oh, I get fired up about this stuff because you're going to run into this a lot. All right. I'm not trying to teach you how to speak in business speak. I'm trying to teach you to recognize it so you can call it out when you see it. Yeah, yeah, I get fired up. And folks, bam, there you go. I just took a quick look at the time to make sure we are OK. Um, you know what? And uh, yeah, gosh, I don't know. You know what I'm going to do? You know what I'm going to do? Uh, we have uh, 14 people. I'll tell you what, guys. I want to get three people. That's six. I want to get three people who have not contributed to share a thought, an example, an idea. Because what I really want to do is I want to get this contributors up to 10. Because then we get a little extra something. So anybody who hasn't contributed so far, give me an example. Have you seen this sort of thing before, um, either for the positive or for the negative, right? Um, and or have you done it yourself? And maybe for a school assignment, right? So um, I'm going to go over to our 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 asking questions screen for a moment. And I would love to see three people who haven't contributed contribute because then we can get another 10. All right, let's see what we can do. Maybe we're not going to get it. That's too bad. By the way, that's on me. That's on me. So I need to put in place more mechanisms that make it an attractive proposition for you to uh, chime in and so forth. So not on you, on me. I'm on the job. I'll do it. I didn't even do a single animation today. Oh, that sucks. That sucks. I should have done a whole lot better there. 
Yeah. And I didn't even get that one to work. I was going to give myself one. Okay. Um, guys, there we are. That's everything for today. So thank you very much. Um, I'll stick around for a couple of minutes to see if there are any questions or comments. If, if there's anything in depth, send me a, uh, an email. Um, but otherwise, have a fantastic day and we'll see you on Wednesday. Have a good one.